sugar chemists have developed their own system for naming carbohydrates. Let me show you why. I've written the structure of glucose here. This feels like a complicated structure, and take a look at the name. Using the systematic nomenclature, look at the name we get for this guy. This is totally unwieldy. If we were talking about the enantiomer, we'd have to write the different configuration at each one of these centers, change all the configuration letters here, and have the same name for the rest of it. All this just to show the two enantiomers of glucose. Take a look at how the sugar chemists do it. They use the Fisher Convention. They name one enantiomer as D-glucose and the other enantiomer as L-glucose, and they are done. And furthermore, if you want to convince yourself that these are mirror images, that they're really enantiomers, it's really easy to visualize a mirror plane between the two molecules. And you can see that the hydroxyl groups are close to the mirror in both cases, or further away from the mirror in both cases, all the way down for every stereogenic center. So these are true enantiomers. How much simpler is that? Let me show you the other conventions that carbohydrate chemists use to name sugars. First, there are some general terms for the functional groups and the numbers of carbons. All of the simple carbohydrates have a carbonyl group. Some of them are aldehydes and others are ketones. They say that a sugar that's an aldehyde is an aldose. They put an O-S-E on the end of everything. So the aldehyde is an aldose and the ketone is a ketose. The sugars have different numbers of carbons and they designate those simply. The common sugars have four, five, six, or seven carbon atoms. They have an O-S-E on the end of everything. This is a tetrose from tetra. This is a pentose, hexose, heptose. And these two terms can be applied to all monosaccharides. Take a look at these two examples, glucose and fructose. The molecule on the left is an aldehyde and it has six carbons. So it's an aldose, it's a hexose, and it's a single name that's called an aldohexose. The molecule on the right is a ketone, so they'll call it a ketose and it also has six carbons. So it's a ketohexose. Beyond these general terms, they have very specific names for sugars. Take a look. The four carbon sugars have two different patterns for the hydroxyl groups. They can be on the same side or on opposite sides. They give each pattern a special compound name. So the one with the hydroxyl groups on the same side is called erythrose, and if they're on opposite sides, it's called threose. This pattern defines the relative stereochemistry. Look at the pentoses. There are four different possible patterns. Ribose, for instance, is the pattern that has all the hydroxyl groups on the same side. There's two of them. They have the same relative stereochemistry, so they're given the same name. They're both called ribose. A different pattern is a ravenose, a third pattern is xylose, and a fourth pattern is lysose. Each pattern gets its own name. Of course, you need to memorize the patterns that go with the names or just look it up in a table. The same applies to hexoses. Now we have eight different possible patterns, so we need eight different names. Here they are. And the name glucose, for instance, which we've been looking at, is this specific pattern. Starting at the top, you have a hydroxyl group on one side and switch as you go down. And the third carbon, you switch again and the fourth one stays on the same side. And it's the same pattern if we look at the other one. There are mirror images, but it's the same pattern, so they have the same name. So again, the relative stereochemistry is defined by the name. You look at a name, you can look at the pattern in a table, and you know exactly what stereochemistry you have for that molecule. But that's not enough, is it? We have another type of stereochemistry, the absolute configuration is the hydroxyl group at the bottom sticking to the right or to the left. For every name, there'll be two possibilities, two enantiomers. So the tetroses, for instance, have two pairs of enantiomers, and in each case, the enantiomers are distinguished by defining whether the hydroxyl group is sticking to the right or to the left. The definition tells us to look at the bottom stereogenic center. If the hydroxyl group is sticking to the right, it's D. 
If the hydroxyl group is sticking to the left, it's L. It's easy to remember, L, left. And the other one is capital D. I want to emphasize that these are capital letters. The small letters mean something else. Little d and L mean the direction of rotation of optical activity. The capital letters are used for absolute configuration like this. And we're all set for naming the structures of the chain aldehydes and ketones, the aldoses and the ketoses, in the open chain form. But the cyclic forms predominate. In fact, in solution, there's very little open chain form of these sugars. For example, glucose can make a five-membered ring or a six-membered ring. If the ring is formed using the upper dark blue hydroxyl group, it's a five-membered ring. And we get this guy. If the ring is formed using the lower light blue hydroxyl group, we get a six-membered ring. We need to have a way of naming which ring it is. Well, take a look. The Hayworth formulas are a great way to draw the structures of rings. The five-membered ring is drawn like this, with the oxygen to the back and the carbon sticking out toward us. Now, this five-membered heterocycle is called furan. So the carbohydrate chemist said, let's call a five-membered ring a furanose. It's simply furan with the O-S-E on the end. And for the six-membered rings, they said, well, we can draw them in the Hayworth formula like this. The oxygen, by the way, is always in that back right corner, and it has a heterocyclic structure like Piran, a six-membered ring with one oxygen in it. So this is Piran. The sugar is the same kind of heterocyclic ring, so they called it a Piranose. So now a sugar has a name to designate relative stereochemistry. It has D and L to designate absolute stereochemistry, and it has Furanose or Piranose to tell us which size ring it has. But wait, there's one more thing. When these rings close, they make a new stereogenic center. This carbon has four different things attached. So of course, it could be R and S, only the carbohydrate chemists don't use R and S. They use the designations alpha and beta. Now remember, what's happening chemically is that hydroxyl group is adding to an aldehyde carbonyl. And when it does that, it's making a new carbon center. There are two R and S possibilities, as I've shown here. When they're in the ring, the hydroxyl group will be sticking up or down. And if it's a carbohydrate, they don't call them R and S. They call it alpha or beta. Here's an example using glucose. Using the Hayworth drawings, the hydroxyl group can either be sticking straight up at the anomeric center or straight down. The sugar chemists agreed that they would call straight down alpha and straight up beta. Now I have to work at remembering which is which, and this helps me. We have alpha, which is down, and beta, which is up. Notice that alpha and beta are in alphabetical order, and D and U are in alphabetical order. In any case, these Hayworth drawings make it very easy to see. As long as we put the oxygen in the upper right corner of this ring, and we have the hydroxymethylene sticking up, beta is up, and alpha is down. It can be useful to show the sugars in the conformational drawings as well, showing chair forms. And in this case, it's a little hard to see which is which. But here's our hydroxyl group, and it's up because hydrogen is down, and it's beta. Here's our hydroxyl group, it's clearly sticking down, and it's alpha. Okay, so now we really are ready to name sugars. We know all the designations for this stereochemistry, and we have a designation for the size of the ring. Let me show you a couple examples. Here are four different drawings for D ribose. Let's look at the second structure. Because we've memorized the pattern for ribose, we know it has all the hydroxyl groups on the same side. And because the hydroxyl group is sticking on the right, we know it's D ribose. Beyond that, we need to tell people that it's a five-membered ring, it's a furanose, and that it has the beta stereochemistry. The hydroxyl group is up. So the full name is beta D ribofuranose. Here's another one. We've been talking about glucose. The full name of the structure is glucose because it has this pattern of hydroxyl groups. The bottom one is sticking to the right, so this is D, and the hydroxyl group is ticking up, so this is beta. 
beta D glucose, and then we need to say the size of the ring. It's a six-membered ring, so it's a pyranose. This works for ketoses also. Take a look at fructose. We've memorized this pattern as fructose. It has a ketone carbonyl, the second carbon. And beyond that, it has the same stereochemical pattern as glucose. This particular one has a hydroxyl group on the right, so it's D. And at the anomeric center, which is this one, we have the hydroxyl group sticking up, so it's beta. It's a five-membered ring, so it's a furanose. Beta-D fructofuranose.